Blog Talk Radio. Hello, welcome to Hidden Human Story Radio with your host, Rita Jean Moran. Today is Thursday, August 8, 2013, and I am your host, Rita Jean Moran. Tonight we have a special guest who will talk to us about the bees and the bee losses and some more information about the very important bee. But before I introduce my guest, I want to talk a little bit about the ancients and how they understood the importance of the bees um, so well that the mother goddess was represented by a bee. Most ancient mother goddesses were agricultural goddesses, and they certainly did understand the job the bees did for them. Now, according to Wikipedia, the bee found in ancient Near East and Aegean cultures was believed to be the sacred insect that bridged the natural world to the underworld. Appearing in tomb decorations, Mycenaean Tholus tombs were even shaped as beehives. Bee motifs are also seen in Mayan cultures, an example being the A Muzan Kab, the bee god, found in Mayan ruins, likely designating honey producing cities, who prized honey as food of the gods. The bee was the emblem emblem of Potnia, the Minoan Mycenaean mistress also referred to as the pure mother bee. Her priestesses received the name of Melissa, which means bee. In addition, priestesses worshipping Artemis and Demeter were called bees. The Delphic priestesses um, are often referred to as a bee, and Pindar notes that she, remain, um, that the, she remained the Delphic bee long after Apollo had usurped the ancient oracle and shrine. The Delphic priestess in historical times chewed a laurel leaf, Harrison noted, but when she was a bee, surely she must have sought her inspiration in the honeycomb. Ernest Neustadt, in his monograph on Zeus, uh, Critogenes, or Cretan-born Zeus, devoted a chapter to the honey goddess Melissa. The Homeric hymn to Apollo acknowledges that Apollo's gift of prophecy first came to him from three bee maidens, usually identified with the Thri, and the Three Eye was a, a trinity of pre Hellenic Aegean bee goddesses. The embossed gold plaque is one of a series of identical plaques recovered at Camaros in Rhodes, dating from the archaic period of Greek art in the 7th, 7th century. But the winged bee goddess they depict must be far older. Now, the Kalari Desert sand people tell of a bee that carried a mantis across a river. The exhausted bee left the mantis on a floating flower but planted a seed in the mantis's body before it died. The seed grew to become the first human. In Egyptian mythology, bees grew from the tears of the sun god Ra when they landed on the desert sand. The bowstring on Hindu love god Kama Diva's bow is made of honeybees. Beekeeping was a Minoan craft, and the, and the fermented honey drink mead was an old Cretan intoxicant older than wine. The Proto-Greek invaders, by contrast, did not bring the art of beekeeping with them. Now, honeybees signified uh, immortality and resurrection were royal emblems of the Merovingians revived by Napoleon. The bee is also the heraldic emblem of the Barberini. In heraldry, the bee symbolizes diligence and indefatigable effort. Someone is said to be busy as a bee when he or she works tirelessly and regardless of schedules or breaks. A community of honeybees has often been employed by political theorists as a model of human society. This metaphor occurs in Aristotle and, and Plato, in Virgil and Seneca, in Erasmus and Shakespeare, and in Bernard Mandeville's Fable of the Bees, are private vices made by public benefits. In Greek mythology, Melissius, which is bee man, the father of the nymphs, 
Adrastia and Ide, who nursed the infant Zeus on Crete, was the eldest and leader of the nine Caretes of Crete. They were conic demons on Mount Ida who clashed their spears and shields to drown out the wails of infant Zeus, whom they re- received from the great goddess Rhea, his mother. The infant god was hidden from his cannibal father and was raised in a cave that was sacred to the goddess, celebrated by the Caretes, who named it Bor and still bears. The names of the two daughters of the Melissius, one called Inevitable and the other simply called Goddess, are names used for the great mother Rhea herself. Now, the infant god was fed on milk and honey. The milk of the goat nymph Almothea, Melissius is simply another name, another form of Melissius, also a Cretan honey man, remembered by later mythographers as a king of Crete. Fermented honey and ethnogen, that was the gift of the goddess, preceded the knowledge of wine in Aegean culture. These honey kings, consorting with the goddess, will have combined their position of authority with a sacral role. But modern interpreters would not follow Robert Graves in asserting that Melissius, Adrastia, and Eos, reputed father, is really their mother, Melissa the goddess, as Queen Bee, who annually killed her male consort. So there you have um, a good idea that the bee uh, has been a, a consistent theme in ancient cultures. So uh, let me introduce my guest tonight. I'm uh, bringing on Mr. David Bergman from the Lake County Beekeepers Association. David, can you hear me? Oops. Hello. Did we lose you? David, can you hear me? I can hear you. Thanks, Rita. Great. Welcome to the show. Um well, I have a lot of questions about bees, so let's begin. Can you please tell the audience about your background and how you got involved in beekeeping? Sure, I'd be happy to, and and thanks again for uh, asking me to join tonight. Um, our family moved uh, from Pen- <clears throat> moved to Illinois from Pennsylvania in uh, 1975. And uh, I was in the process of, of going to the University of Illinois in Chicago for my biology degree. Uh, when we moved to the area, my parents uh, went and visited uh, as one of the social programs with friends. They got together. And one of the things that there was a lady in Lake Forest who had a very famous herb garden. And she had herbs from all sorts of different areas and regions and planted in themes. And, and so uh, they went over to see her herb garden. And she had a couple beehives there uh, to pollinate her herb garden. Uh, my father saw this and got really excited about starting with bees. Uh, this was uh, something that he was very interested in. He says, "He says, Dave, we need to we need to start with bees." Well, I had never eaten really honey much. I had never been stung before, and so I I was just like, Dad, I'm going to school. I'm trying to get my degree. I'm not really interested. And he says, he went to the library and he says, "Here, read this book." So I got my first book out of the library started reading it, and if you're a biology major, reading about uh, the social insects and in particularly some of the amazing things that the honeybee uh, is able to do through communication, both physical and, and uh, pheromone type of communication, uh, I was hooked. So five books later, I was ready to start the new hobby. Wow. Uh, we uh, So... <laughs> so uh, a lot of a lot of learning that you can get initially uh from the books there's a lot of people that have written information out there and uh and it gives you some at least basic uh information to get going so uh we then said okay how do you start with bees where are you going to get them well at the time Sears and Roebuck had a uh a uh, specialty farm catalog and so we went over to Sears and picked up their specialty catalog, and ordered our first two beehives from Sears. Uh, the bees showed up at the post office. Uh, my mother had a friend from England who had kept bees there, and he helped me put my first two colonies in. And so from that standpoint, uh, I, I, was, I was going with two, and I had a variety of adventures over the years. 
and that was over 30 some years ago. Uh, today, I take over. I take care of over 30 colonies in Lake County. Uh, I'm currently the president of the Lake County Beekeepers Association, and have served in that role for many years. And then I lecture to various to talk to kids about beekeeping as well. So it is my hobby. It's certainly not my job, but uh, it's a fun hobby, interesting hobby. And you know, as for somebody who's interested in biology uh, and the environment, it, it's certainly an appropriate one. Very interesting. Well, Dave, how many times have you been stung, if ever? <laughs> well, before I started, I'd never been stung, and I can't say that anymore. I've been stung hundreds of times over the years. Uh, I am effectively, essentially immune at this point, but it still hurts just like anything else. But I think it's, um, I think it's important to note and let people know that, that honeybees are actually a, a very gentle insect, and, and they tend not to come in and interact with people because they're interested in doing their work and uh and going and going out to the flowers and get their get their uh their nectar and such and bring it back to the colony. So uh unless you're out there or you're stepping on flowers, the, you're just not going to come in into into um contact with the honeybee that much. Now, there's only two reasons why a honeybee uh might sting. First is self-preservation. So Usually, as a kid, the most of the time you're going to get, uh, you might get stung by a honeybee, is you're walking barefoot and the bees are on the clover in the grass, and uh, you're, you're, you might step on the honeybee, and she's going to sting uh, if, you, if she gets stepped on. Uh, the second is to protect the hive. So she's going to protect her hive just like if you have a guard dog protecting your house. Uh, the honeybee takes care of their colony. And so if you're not around the colony, uh, then you really shouldn't have a problem with bees bothering you. Uh, as a beekeeper, it's part of my task to go into the hive, and it's part of their task to keep me out of the hive. And so that's where I end up uh, getting stung. I don't get stung all the time. Uh, there are things that can be done. The use of, of smoke has been known uh, for thousands of years that uh, smoke tends to distract or calm the bee colonies down. And so when, when the hive is smoked, and I use a tool called a bee smoker, and you build a little, uh, a little fire inside a, a can, and there's bellows on it, like uh, bellows you might use to uh, try and, and increase a fire, uh, or you know, trying to to raise the temperature of a fire, but you puff the bellows, uh, and and the air goes through this can of of uh, burning material that is smoldering, and smoke comes out the front, and uh, you blow that over the frames, and it causes the bees to start consuming honey. When I try to explain this to kids, how this works, that well, if you're a honeybee, where do you live? Well, in the wild, you kind of live in the forest, in the trees, in a hollowed out area, maybe an, an old an, a rotted out portion of a tree. And and uh so you're in the you're in the woods and woods occasionally have forest fires and forest fires produce smoke. And uh, the honey bee has evolved a technique that uh if they think that their house is on fire and they have to leave the only thing that they can do is take some of their food with them. If they have to abandon their home, they'll take food with them, which means they start eating honey. The beekeeper then blows smoke over it. The bees start eating honey, and they're less concerned with the beekeeper and more concerned about eating honey. And so you can typically get in and out without being uh, stung by the bees. And so, uh, uh, again, I don't get stung every time I'm out. I've been uh, There's been times where I've gone multiple years uh, without being stung, and again, uh, it's my, my time where it happens to me is when I'm in there working in a hive uh, when I shouldn't be in there, and uh, later at, later in the day or when it's dark, everybody's home and they're not as they're not as uh, tolerant of of somebody coming in, or on cold days uh, they're not as tolerant on, on me coming in, but on hot, warm, sunny days, I can be there in my shirt and t-shirt or my shorts and t-shirt. And they're happy to see me, or are they just happy to ignore me? Very good points. 
So, so Dave, why are the bees so important? And can you just do a quick description on how a bee colony works? Sure. Well, that's a lot of details in there, but let's start with the importance uh, to at least people. So, so honeybees are responsible for a significant uh, portion of the food that we eat. Estimates somewhere between 15 and 30 percent uh, of the food that we eat are attributable to pollinated products, fruits, vegetables, nuts, etc. And so uh, honeybees, uh, and these are European honeybees because uh, these were imported from Europe in, uh, when the first settlers came from Europe to the U.S., uh, they brought these bees over, and they're very efficient pollinators. So they are good to uh, pollinate crops and, and create high yields of fruits and vegetables and nuts. So if you have, uh, you know, if there's uh, bee die-offs or there's less overall honeybees available and there's challenges with that, then we have the, we have the problem of potential for less food being available. Not all foods that we eat come from, from honeybees or, or from pollinated products, but certainly any of the ones that are, that are produced in large volumes, for example, the almond crops in California, are heavily dependent on, uh, on pollination uh, from European honeybees. So there are other wild pollinators, like bumblebees and mason bees and other solitary bees, uh, but they don't have the sheer numbers there and, and can't match the efficiency that the, the European honeybee can, can achieve. So uh, you have the possibility of, of reduced crop yields, and, and so that would mean less food available for people to eat. So that's kind of the, the major importance uh, for the honeybee. Uh, the, uh, I mean, it can also be a, um, uh, an indication of, of how toxic the environment is. If you're losing honeybees, uh, you have the potential of losing other pollinators. If, if, if the issue is of bee dying off happens to be uh, toxins in the environment like pesticides and such, uh, bumblebees are just as susceptible as our, our, our butterflies and some other uh, pollinators. And so, uh, you know, you have a, a, an issue there also. Um, so for how, the hive, how the bee colony works. So it's important to know what kind of bees are in the colony. Uh, honey bee colonies, they have three casts of bees in there. Uh, the first cast is the, the female sterile worker or the honey bee worker. And the honey bee worker, uh, by her name, is she's responsible for doing all the work in the hive. She's responsible for going out to the flowers and collecting nectar, which is turned into honey. Uh, she goes out, and because her body is hairy when she's crawling around the flowers to get to the nectar, she gets covered with pollen, and the pollen is brought back uh, as well. The pollen is uh, high in protein, and the honeybees use the pollen uh, to feed the developing bees uh, that uh, so the baby bees and so they need the protein source where the the adult workers don't. Uh, the honeybee uh, also collects water and regulates the temperature of the hive. So in inside the beehive, uh, the colony is made from wax. Uh, the the wax is secreted from glands in the bee's abdomen. And so if you're in a beehive and, and uh, you're going to see beeswax in there, which is what they make the honeycomb from, well, wax melts in hot temperatures. And so the honeybee has to uh, keep the temperature regulated for two reasons. She's got to keep it cool enough so that the wax doesn't melt and the honey doesn't run and make a big mess. She also has to keep it warm enough so that the babies can hatch. The bees need to keep their eggs warm just like a chicken needs to keep her egg warm, uh, and so the, the bee has to regulate the temperature very well to be able to raise her young as well as keeping the wax from melting. And the honeybee worker does that, so she's a, she's a hardworking individual, and uh, she essentially has a short lifespan because she works herself to death. Essentially, her lifespan is about six weeks during the, the main season, and it's determined from uh, how long her wings will last. Uh, her wings don't regenerate and regrow after damage, and so as she goes out to the flower and gets blown around and banged in the wind, as her wings tatter, 
eventually uh, she can no longer fly, and then she crawls off to die. Mm. Uh, the sec- so so it's it's a tough life as a worker yeah. bee. Her her job is to sacrifice herself for the betterment of the colony. So it's a very noble, a very noble but very short a short life. Uh, the next bee in the hive is uh, the queen bee, and the queen bee, uh, even though she's named queen, she is not by any means royalty. Uh, she's not the ruler, uh, but rather she's the mother of all the bees in the hive. Uh, she's a fertile female, and, and in good condition, she can lay up to 2,000 eggs a day for many, many years. When I'm talking to the kids, I said, can you imagine a chicken that laid 2,000 eggs a day and how, how high a pile of eggs that would be? So the, right. the, 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 uh, the queen really, really uh, is an egg-laying machine. She needs to, her egg laying is determined by uh, how strong a queen she is. Uh, she also regulates uh, her egg laying based on what's happening in the environment. Are the bees bringing in large quantities of, of protein or, by the, or pollen from the, from the flowers? If they're not bringing in protein, the queen says, hey, I have nothing to feed the babies, and so uh, I have to regulate how many eggs I'm laying. So she will during the end of the season when the flowers and it starts to get fall and there's less flowers, uh, she will slow down her egg laying. So she's laying 2,000 during the peak of the season and then much, much lower and she'll stop laying in, in the winter and really not. And so, you know, November, December, January in this area, she's not really laying any eggs. And she'll start up in February, March, start to to lay eggs, and then the bees can br- start bringing in more pollen as the crocus and some of the early flowers come up in the spring. Uh-huh. The third bee that's in the hive are, is the drone or male bee. And the drone is is only around for fertilization for the queen. He doesn't do anything else. The drone is lazy. He uh-huh. does no work, does not collect anything, uh, and is basically taken care of by the worker sisters. Doesn't feed himself, doesn't clean himself, doesn't really contribute anything to the hive. But the bees keep him around uh, because for emergencies, if they if they have a new queen and the queen needs to be mated, then they ha- they will have the drones around. However, so the drones have a good year and a good summer. But when the resources dry up and the nectar slows down, and uh, the flowers start to go away, uh, they don't need the drones anymore. And so they're the sisters who have uh, taken care of the bees or the drones all season, they kick them out. And the drones, uh, they're put out in the, in the fall, and they, they die. So they don't wow. last the winter. And so the, then from a standpoint of uh, how the, the bees get honey is that the workers go out, they fly out to the flowers, and they collect what they collect. And so they collect from the flowers both nectar and pollen. And nectar is the sweet substance or the sweet liquid that's secreted by the flowers that attract the bees to them so that the bees uh, can provide the pollination that the flower needs to produce the fruit or whatever it's producing. And the nectar uh, is, uh, is sucked up by the bees through their, through their straw-like tongues. It's held temporarily in a honey stomach, and they they carry that back to the hive and they spit it into into the honeycomb. It's very moist at that point. The the nectar the the, um, the nectar that the flower produces has too high a moisture content, and so the honeybees dry it down. They gradually dry it down, and when it's dry enough, the bees consider it to be complete. At which point, it's really officially honey. And they'll put a lid on it. They'll put a, uh, a wax capping on top of the cell that it goes into. And uh, they put the cap on it, and they said, okay, the jar now is, is closed on that one, and so it will be kept dry, and that honey will last in that comb for a long, 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 long time. Uh, honey is one of the only foods that never spoils as long as it's kept airtight. And so by putting the, ca- the wax capping on, the honeybees are preserving that so that they have food that they can eat during the winter. Pollen that the bees collect is, the, as I mentioned, is, is high in protein. And 
the bees need to feed that to the growing uh, the growing larva. So in um, in the honeybee colony, the, when the queen lays an egg, it looks like an egg, not the same shape as a, a chicken egg, but essentially it's a, it's an, a, it's a, a small white egg. It hatches into a larva, which uh, is a little strange looking. It's white and looks like a maggot, but uh, similar. It's a little wormy thing, and uh, that's the second stage. And and the bees feed that uh, for three days, royal jelly. And after three days, they feed it a combination of pollen and honey, which the, they have termed as bee bread. And that's what the the larva eats until the point that it's uh, sealed in its cell, and it goes through metamorphosis just like a caterpillar does or a moth does when it changes from a from a caterpillar to, uh, to a butterfly. And so the the uh, the bee larva will go change to a pupa after it goes through muta- uh, metamorphosis, and goes through some additional development in there, at which point then it hatches out, and it becomes an adult. Uh, the worker bee has many jobs, and their job changes over a while. So for the first week, uh, or week or two, the honey bee stays, uh, worker stays inside the colony doing jobs in there. And its first job is a cleaning job, and it goes in and cleans cells to get ready for the queen to lay. And so it makes sure the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the chamber is nice and clean so that the queen can come in and lay an egg and everything would be good. And then the bee will then go do a feeding job, and that will be a next job. It'll be feeding, and then the next job will be something else. And then finally, get to get to the point where they're a guard bee. They're protecting the entrance. Might be a job. And then the final, the last job of their life would be a field bee, when the bee goes to leave the colony uh, to go out to the uh, flowers and bring in the resources that are needed. Um, the uh, the unique part uh, when the when the bee goes out. So the bee goes out for the first time. She has never seen the world. For the first couple weeks of her life, she's really stayed in the dark. And so when she goes out on her first flight, uh, it's very interesting. She does an orientation flight. And uh, on on a day when a thousand bees come out and do their first orientation flight, it's really cool to watch. Uh, you see them waving slowly, waving slowly back and forth, back and forth, back and forth in front of the hive, just kind of getting their bearings. And then gradually the, they stop the back and forth in front of the hive and they start doing circles. And they start swinging hives around the circle, or circles around the hive. And so what she's doing is getting her bearings, getting a, a, a chance to take a look at the landmarks and, and, and uh, getting an idea of where she lives. Once she's got that all down, uh, she can go out and fly out to the field and, and start to look for resources. If she finds resources, she can come back and communicate that through a dance. She can communicate that to her sisters. And uh, she can say, hey, out, uh, out 200 meters to the left, there's a great new flower source. And so she's able to communicate direction, uh, direction to by by the sun, so direction to the by, uh, direction to the uh, to the flower source, and approximately how far, and that allows the the honey bees to be a very effective both pollinator and nectar collector. Where some of the other uh, the other uh, insects are don't have that kind of uh, efficiency or communication path. And uh, so that's essentially how it how it works. Uh, the uh, when the when the honey is complete, the bees will put a cap on it. The beekeeper, when they're ready to take the honey, can cut that wax capping off with a knife, and the comb can either be crushed uh, and strained, or uh, in some of the managed colonies, you can centrifuge that uh, comb. And by centrifuging it, the uh, honey is thrown out of the comb against the walls of the centrifuge. It drains down by gravity through a, and there's a hole in the bottom of the centrifuge. You catch it into a bucket. You can run it through a strainer, and you can put it into a jar after that. And if you set it on a shelf, it would be good thousands of years later. Wow. 
Um, it does take the center. The centrifuging process is actually more efficient. It takes about eight pounds. The bees, when they grow wax from their bodies, it's it's a fatty a fatty substance. Uh, that they grow, and so they have to consume resources. They have to consume honey to be able to grow that wax. It takes them about eight wax, eight pounds of wax to, or eight pounds of honey to make one pound of wax. So if you're able to give them comb back after you centrifuge it, you've actually get more honey because you're giving them back something that they don't have to uh, reproduce. Very interesting and complex. Well, can I? Uh ask you about colony collapse disorder and have you ever seen it with your hives uh fortunately well yes and no probably more no than yes because colony collapse disorder is not entirely understood yet and there are many different things uh, th there's not a single uh, a single condition or a single threat or or one thing that you can point to that says, oh, well, yes, this is colony collapse disorder, this is what's causing it, and yes, this is killing my hives. So so it's very challenging to, to say, have I seen it or not. Now, but it is clear that bees are under stress in the environment, and are, bees are disappearing in large numbers in certain regions, especially in California and I probably in Florida as well. Now, in uh, in Illinois, we have hives that are dying, but not necessarily for the same reasons that they they are seeing in some of the other regions. So the cause of the disappearance or the cause of the collapse does not seem to be uniform uh, across the country. Uh, in Illinois, we've seen significant die off of honeybee colonies. And in my 35 years of keeping bees, in the first 15 years or so, I was so happy I never lost a bee. Uh, I lost bees. I mean, they died. But I didn't lose a, I didn't lose a hive. They, they lived from year to year. I didn't even replace queens. They would upgrade or they would, as the one queen got old, they would replace her with a new queen. And I didn't have to do anything. So I had no hives that are dying off. And now... I'm losing colonies on the order of 20 to 70 percent a year. Now, wow. in this in this area, uh, the major threat is a parasite, and this parasite is an invading pest. So this is like many of the other invasive species of all these things that we see, whether that be uh, you know certain flowers or or uh, or uh, you know invading animals or something where they they're new in an area. Uh, that they've never been before, and, and the parasite that we're having problems and, and had significant issues is called the Varroa mite. And the Varroa mite is a, uh, it's like a tick. The, a tick might be to you and me, where the, the mite is drinking the blood of the, of the bee. The ticks would drink our blood when they get on them. And, and it's, a, it's a transplanted pest that uh, was originally a parasite of the Asian honeybee and never really had been seen before in it, uh, by the European honeybee. So they grew up in an area where this mite did not exist. Well, somehow this parasite got brought into the United States. Uh, it has got onto the honeybee, the European honeybees, and the Europe, European honeybees did not have a way of dealing with this, and so they started having significant uh, problems with these, uh, with these varroa mites. Gotcha. I can typically tell in, 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 um, in our area if a, a hive has succumbed to varroa mites because uh, there are very few bees left in the colony. But uh, in, in uh, say, September or October, there's lots and lots of bees. I mean, a, a bee colony uh, is twenty to 50,000 individuals. And so you'll start to see in August you've got 20,000, 30,000 bees, and you'll come back in November and there may be 5,000. And all of a sudden you say, what's happening? I mean, they're not all gone, but all of a sudden you're seeing a significant uh, drop-off of population. And, and so the, these, the varroas are blood feeders, or, bee, you know, bee blood feeders. 
Mm-hmm. And so uh, they tend to feed uh, uh, mostly on the developing bees, and they like the drones because uh, they take a little bit longer to develop, and so they feed on the pupa, the larva and pupa in the cells. Uh, but when the queen in the fall, she stops laying eggs because um, the, there's no pollen coming in, so she stops laying her eggs because they have no food. Well, the varroa now, which had been nice and happy inside the cells to, to feed on the uh, the pupa, now longer, no longer have any food, and so they switch over to the adults. And so you'll now have each adult bee having multiple mites sitting on them and drinking their blood, which then reduces the lifespan. And so very quickly you see this collapse in population. Mm. Not, I don't think that that's the same problem that they're seeing in some of the pollination areas of California, but it's certainly a major, major problem in, in this particular area. That's on top. There's there's more on top of that. So varroa brings in viruses, and and so there's certain viruses that uh, the bees. I mean, there's. I, I don't even know all the names of them. Acute wing virus, where you start seeing bees born with shriveled wings. Uh, that can no longer fly, and that's one of them. And there's, there's like three or four other ones, uh, paralysis one. And so there's there's a number of viruses that the varroa mites have brought in, which also uh, uh, brings in a problem. So uh, that's a significant problem in this particular area. Gotcha. Uh, there there's some there's there's other um, uh, there's other environmental related issues. Uh, you know, pesticides in there that may be causing a problem in some other areas. And and so there's a lot of uh, research being done, uh, but there's no, there hasn't been a single, um, there hasn't been a single smoking gun uh, that that you can point to that says, okay, yes, this is it, and we, are, we have or have not uh, had this in our area. But it, it's clear that bees are dying off across the country, and and uh, people are struggling to keep their colonies populated, and beekeepers are, uh, you know, commercial beekeepers are struggling to uh, keep their colonies uh, available to to pollinate major important crops uh, like the almond crop. Mm. So all of this then leads to another problem. And, and I, there's nobody really that I've said I've thought that's really writing that, but I started observing this based on uh, the last five years. So we are in a cycle in this country uh, where I so I say so I lose 50 percent of my colonies one year. So I have 20. I have 30 colonies. I lose 15 of them. I have to replace them. What do I do? Well, there's a there's a business out there that packages bees up in California and they ship them to Illinois with a new queen, and uh, I can take that one and I can shake them into my hive that died out and I can get that colony repopulated, and that'll cost me seventy five eighty five dollars to do that, and so many beekeepers uh, will purchase. Uh, package. They call this package bees. And so many pe- beekeepers uh, will buy packages and get them reestablished. Well, multiply me by tens of thousands. I'm buying 15, and so is my neighbor, and so is this guy. And so, you know, our club, uh, the Lake County Beekeepers, uh, we used to buy 100 packages maybe 10 years ago, 50 to 100 packages. Now we're buying 300, 350. And there's a there's another beekeeping club in the next county, and there's another guy over there. So there's hundreds of thousands of packages that are now being purchased every spring. Now I want my bees uh, to be delivered in April, so I can get them in time to start getting the the fruit blossoms and be available to the clover for the clover honey flow. So I need them in April. Well, so does my neighbor. So does my neighbor. So does the guy in the next county coming over. So all of a sudden, in a very short period of time, hundreds of thousands of pounds of, of packages and hundreds of thousands of queens are needed. And these hundreds of thousands of queens have to mate with millions of drones. And so in a very short period of time, this enormous wave and this enormous volume of, of bees need to be grown, mated properly, and delivered 
across the country. Well, if the weather is bad in one day when the the, uh, the bees are wherever they're being coming from, whether they're coming from uh, California, whether they're coming from Hawaii, if the weather is a little bit rainy and the bees don't get out and the queen doesn't fly and she doesn't mate well, all of a sudden I've got poor queens. And so I started seeing uh, poor, uh, poor uh, the, the queens that are not as viable. Uh, the queen should be able to live two to five years. And we start to see some queens that are, you know, sometimes lasting only a year or maybe a year and a half before her capacity starts to, to taper off. So that's a big challenge. So there's, you know, there's lots of uh, consternation as about how to deal with that. And a lot of people trying to grow more bees locally and split the survivors that are left to try and keep this going on. So the, the die-off is having significant impact to every beekeeper in the country. It's a wow. big challenge, but it's just not, I can't point to one and say, okay, this is colony collapse disorder. Gotcha. Well, if, if it's okay, I want to read something from Wikipedia because um, it, it talked about colony collapse disorder or something close to that, but in the early 1900s, and then I have a just a couple combination questions. Um, you've been pretty thorough already on the CCD, but let me read this. Um, limited sure. occurrences, okay. Limited occurrences resembling CCD have been documented as early as 1869, and this set of symptom um, and this set of symptoms has, in the past several decades, been given many different names: disappearing disease, spring dwindle. May disease, autumn collapse, and fall dwindle disease. Most recently, a similar phenomenon in the winter of 2004-2005 occurred and was attributed to the varroa mites, which you just talked about, the vampire mite scare. Uh, though this was uh, never ultimately confirmed, but it probably has been now. This cause of um, the appearance of the syndrome has never been determined. Upon recognition that the syndrome does not seem to be seasonally restricted and that it may not be a disease in the standard sense, um, that there may not be a specific causative agent, the syndrome was renamed. There was a well-documented outbreak of colony losses spreading from the Isle of, of Wight to the rest of the U.K. in 1906. These losses later were attributed to a combination of factors including adverse weather, intensive apiculture leading to inadequate forage, and a new infection, the chronic bee paralysis virus. But at the time, the cause of this agricultural beekeeping problem was similarly mysteriously unknown. Reports show that this behavior in hives in the U.S. in 1918 and 1919 coined mystery disease by some, is eventually, uh, is eventually, became more ni uh, eventually became more widely known as disappearing disease. And uh, Ortle in 1965 reported that the hives afflicted with disappearing disease in Louisiana had plenty of honey in the combs, although there were, a few, uh, were few or no bees, discrediting reports that attributed the disappearances to lack of food. The mechanisms of CCD are still unknown, as you said, but many causes have been proposed as causative agents, malnutrition, pathogens, immunodeficiencies, mites, fungus, pesticides, beekeeping practices such as the use of antibiotics or long-distance transportation of beehives, and electromagnetic radiation. Whether any single factor or a combination of factors acting independently in different areas affected by CCD or acting in tandem is responsible is still unknown. However, most recent information suggests, suggests a combination of factors is most likely. It is uh, likewise still uncertain whether CCD is a genuinely new phenomenon as opposed to a known phenomenon that previously only had a minor impact. So uh, my question is, you know, you mentioned the, the um, vampire um, mite and the moving of the queens from California to to where they are needed. Um, I'm wondering if there's any other causes, such as a pesticide 
or if the cell phones might contribute, if anybody's figured that out. And I've also even heard um, of some um, companies that take away the, the honey and replace it with uh, sugar water. And I wonder if, if any of those have been shown um, to, to contribute to the CCD. Okay, so uh, the, um, you know, honeybees can, uh, can, you know, they've been around for millions of years. Uh, they can, uh, when hit with a, with, you know, they, when they're hit with a new problem, it's going to cause significant die-off, and hopefully you'll start getting the ones that are, are either immune or more resistant to whatever the threat is, and uh, then subsequent, they, they will then be successful, and evolution will take some of the things. Uh, but um, it takes time for that to happen. You know, the Isle of Wight disease, uh, you know, they it wiped out everything there. And, you know, some of these were brood diseases that we still are faced with today uh, that, uh, that the beekeeper has to deal with it. I don't know about the cell phones. You know, I, I read that one originally. You know, there, there's, I don't know how they'll prove that one. The, the honeybees uh, navigation how they navigate? Uh, they navigate to the sun, but there is some belief that there's magnetism that they they uh, that they, they can judge some things in the mag- Earth's magnetic field. And and if the honeybee lost its ability to find its way home, this would be a devastating thing. They would disappear and never. They would just get lost if they if there was some reason why they couldn't. Uh, they have to orient. They have to be able to find their way out. Normally. Under normal conditions, they do that every time you move them more than two miles. If something interfered with that, that would be a big problem. But I don't know that anybody has has found out uh, one particular thing that that says, okay, yes, this is making them, uh, this is causing them to have orientation problems. Um, the uh, the varroa has in our region. Uh, it, it's been here for more than ten years now and I think that's the biggest problem that we're dealing with uh, right now. Uh, But a lot of people are pointing to pesticides now, certain pesticides. And pesticides have been problematic over over the years. Uh, There was a pesticide probably 10 or 20 years ago uh, where they, um, they, they took a common uh, they took a common uh, garden pesticide, malathion, which people use on rose bushes and such, and they wanted to make it last longer. And so they, they micro-encapsulated it like uh, you might do with a time-released, uh, a time-released cold pill that a, a human might take. Uh, they, they, they wanted it to last longer in the field, and so they, they micro-encapsulated it, and they used that for spraying. Well, the problem was, in that particular case, the pollen, the uh, the uh, uh, the microencapsulated pesticide, the little the little tiny time pills were about the size of pollen grains, and so the bees would oh. pick them up, carry them back to the hive, uh, and and uh, the, then the hive would die, and so that oh, one was yeah. taken off the the market because it was a big problem. So the one that they're they're blaming right now, and and I don't, there's still a lot of studies going on. Uh, but the one that uh, that uh, a lot of people are are uh, complaining about and pointing to this is these uh, is neonicotinoids is that they're pointing to, and as I, ha- I haven't I'm not an expert in that area, but some one of the things that I've read part of the problem is how l- they're not as lethal as other pesticides. Now, why would you think that's a problem? Well, the problem is. If you had a if you sprayed a honeybee with a lethal pesticide, she dies in the field. Okay, she doesn't take that back to the colony. Honeybees are replaceable. There's 2000 a day being born. And so if you kill a honeybee in the field, yes it's sad, but it doesn't kill the colony. If you put out a sublethal or a pesticide that that is not as lethal that it gets onto the pollen of the plant or in the nectar of the plant and the bee fly, the bee collects it and it manages to take it back to the hive without dying and placing it into the colony. Now you have pesticide building up into the colony. And this is the big fear, is that you get a low-level dose of a pesticide 
that builds up over time and it makes the honeybee colony less viable. And that's a big concern because uh, that can damage it over time, make the bee's life shorter, make less, you know, make the maybe the less babies being born because there's problems there. And so that's one that a lot of people are are wondering whether that's causing the uh, the big, you know, the, the, some of the big die-offs, and so uh, I know in Europe they're they're putting in some some uh, uh, some uh, legislation to try and control that, and and maybe we'll see as examples that if, if there's improvement, then I'm sure that then that will be uh, pushed more more globally. Uh, as far as uh, you, you mentioned, um, sugar water. Uh, sugar water and moving. So so I mean honey is expen- or honey is valuable. Uh people like to pay I mean people like honey. There's uh there's a value to it. Uh, people um uh, like good honey, they they'll pay money for it and it's more valuable than sugar water. So uh if there's a honey crop on there and the and the beekeeper can take it away and uh feed the the um uh the honey bee with sugar water uh, they get more money. Honey or sugar is cheaper than honey. Uh, that's a pride. I, I don't know that I could. You could point to that being the sole reason, but it's not. It's certainly not good in the long term for the honeybee. Uh, there's been work done at the University of Illinois that has been mapping the DNA of honeybees versus other bees. Well, the the European honeybee is short a lot of genes. They actually have a lesser amount of of uh, genes than uh, an attributable nectar collector, another one. I don't pick one, the mason bee or something like that. If they, if they map it out and say uh, there's, there's millions here, well, there's, there's a less than, you know, there's less uh, genes in the, in the honeybee. And so uh, there's a belief that the honeybee uh, makes up the genes that are missing as they've done the mapping and this is uh, Dr. May Birnbaum of University of Illinois. Uh, she she studied, and, and part of the genes that they're missing are ones that deal with environmental toxins. And so the belief is that it, the, that the honeybee in, uh, there has uh, supplemented her her ability to deal with environmental toxins through the use of honey and propolis, which is a substance that the bees collect from plants. And so they've used naturally occurring uh, products to help out and fill in with the, 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 the lack of ability to deal with toxins. So honey is a, uh, is an, is, has antibiotic properties, propolis has antibiotic properties, and so the honeybee uses those things to deal with the environment or problems in the environment. If you take those things away and substitute sugar water, you're putting the honeybee colony under stress because they're they're losing some of their nutrition. And so while it may not cause the collapse, it certainly can stress a colony. And I don't know anybody that would want to do that for a long period of time because it's just not good for them. Gotcha. Now, moving, moving the colony shouldn't be a problem. Uh, I guess it depends on how often you move them. Uh, they have the ability to reorient as long as uh, you know as long as they're um, uh, given time and so uh, you know if you move them there and you're leaving them there for a week or so they should be able to to recover if you're moving them daily uh, you can put your honeybee colonies under stress I would think so on its own I don't know either of those things would cause collapse but they certainly are, are two potentially big threats for for stress anyway, their stress. And, and and many people are saying, look, you know, I, there's not one thing, but you take your malathion that, or, or your neonicotinoids, then you take your hives that are being moved, and you take your hives that are being fed sugar water without the benefic- benefits of honey. All these things give the, the bee, the adult bee, I, I'm creating less viable adults, which means my colonies die faster or need to have their bees replaced faster. Gotcha. Well, I have a few more questions, David. How are you doing? Do you need to t- do we need to take a break? No, I'm okay. Okay. Anytime, let me know if you need some water or a quick break. I'm going to continue right. on because this is very interesting and very informative tonight. 
Um, I had talked to someone about, um, I guess uh, there's an issue with the beekeepers being sued. If someone gets stung, they immediately, assume, you know, if they're near a hive, they immediately assume it's a bee, but oftentimes it's a wasp. And I was just wondering if you can just um, reiterate that, that, um, you know, bees are not going to go for your soda pop. They're looking more for what's on a flower rather than a wasp. Yeah, yeah. So so I haven't heard of a whole lot of lawsuits, but, but certainly the honey bee takes a lot of uh, bad rap for uh, the, the uh, things that the yellow jacket wasp does. Uh, they're about the same size. Uh, they're about the same shape. The coloration is different. So in, when people start saying, I've got these bees all over me, I said, what color are they? And I said, oh, they're yellow. I said, they're not honeybees. The honeybees, there are no yellow honeybees. And so wow. honeybees at the lightest color are orange. And, and honeybees can be orange, brown, or, or black. Uh, but they're not, they're not yellow. So when I hear yellow, that's wasps. And the yellow jacket wasp eats everything and drinks everything that we do. And so, you know, they're around us when we're outside at our picnic. They're out there trying to get into our can of pop. And so the, our chances of of, uh, of interacting in a negative fashion, oh, and a honeybee can sting once and she dies. A yellow jacket can sting all she wants. So, so uh, you know, the, the, uh, and, and the yellow jacket is more aggressive than a honeybee. Honeybee, she's interested in going out to the flower, collecting nectar, collecting pollen, and getting back to the hive. She has no interest in anything else. And so, but, but the, you know, the, when people, when you, when you hear people, they say, oh, look at all these bees around my can of pop, around my chicken at the picnic. And, and so they take a lot of blame. So, well, if people aren't necessarily suing, or when you, when, if anybody takes those to court, they're going to say, well, prove it's his bee and not a yellow jacket. You know, the, uh, it, it's just not provable. And, and so the, uh, you know, um, my my feeling is if somebody is is suing or being faced with a lawsuit, it's a frivolous lawsuit, and and that person really uh, should be looking at wasps more than more than honeybees. Yeah, I I agree. I heard that, and the wasp also has its function in nature. It keeps you know the mosquito and pest population down as well. Yeah, they, so we they have eat to, other insects. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, we we don't want to get angry at the wasp either, <laughs> because sure, they they sure. help us too. Um, so I, as as a lay person who is not a beekeeper, how can I help? Um, you know, to make to make things easier on the bees and ensure that they're still around. Well, probably the best thing if you have an opportunity uh, to put something in your garden that's attractive to nectar collectors. It'll be good for for your garden. It'll be good for the the bees. And I mean, there's a wonderful you know if you go to the the garden down uh, you know around Millennium Park, they put in a wildflower garden that is just is so exciting. I, I went down there for the first well, first time a couple years ago, and I was I look at all the bees. And so they they put down uh, a a variety, and you you really want flowers that that uh, come out at different times. So that there is a um, uh, there is a season, or they're you know they're going to work on this flower for a week while it's in bloom, and, and when that one's dying off, there's a new one coming up, so that they can move it over. So you'd like flowers that open up on a, a range of time from from uh, April through September. So if you're able, if you have a garden, and you're able to put in uh, some some uh, pollinator-friendly or, or nectar-producing-friendly flowers, that certainly would be appreciated by the bees as well as the beekeepers. And I think you'd like having the, the nice, pretty flowers that the bees are taking care of. Uh, if you're growing something in your garden, peppers or, or tomatoes and uh, you know, or, or fruit trees, certainly those things would be, uh, be good as well. Well, I'm definitely going to do that. I, I I have a little bit of a garden, and I always try and put some flowers in as well. But um, you talked about it a little bit. I'm going to just ask you to reiterate, what is the future going to be if we have no bees? Well, if the futures are, you know, so there are, there are I have seen some, some uh, either Yahoo videos or YouTube videos. So it, in areas 
that uh, have uh, been heavily sprayed in the past with pesticides, they have a big problem. They're trying to feed people, and they have no bees. So I've actually seen in China, uh, they have uh, teams of people that their job is to go out and do the bees' job. And so they go out and individually pollinate flowers by hand. And so they have people climbing around, and I don't know if it's plums or apples, but uh, they, they've gone out and the, the, the people go out and they take a little Q-tip and they go from uh, the flower to flower and try and cross-pollinate to, to make the fruit. Uh, the people are nowhere near as efficient as uh, the honeybee is. And so, you know, if if we don't have the bees in the future, we're going to have to do like they've done in some of areas of China, either find a, an alternate pollinator uh, or uh, we'll end up with less food uh, or less nutritious food. We'll lose certain crops because we just won't have enough bees to do it. So it's not a – I hope that that never comes to pass because that's not a uh, an attractive future for the kids. Not at all. Now, uh, if someone wanted to become a beekeeper, is there um, a certain way they can do it, a site, a group that they can uh, look into? Sure. The, the, uh, uh, the, in, in our, the, in, so, so basically in every county, in, in, uh, at least every county in northern Illinois, uh, there's a beekeeping uh, group. From, and actually, there's multiples in Chicago, but the Lake County, Cook to Page County, McHenry County, there are there are beekeeping organizations uh, in uh, in every county in the area. So there are resources, and there are people like you. So, uh, and and because of the the die off of the bees, the resurgence of interest. Uh, five six years ago, we had 15 people left in the club, and these are old guys just talking to each other about their hobbies once a month. And now we have 125 people in our club. Uh, there's uh, many more women that have gotten into the club, so we're about 50-50 men and women. Uh, there's uh, lots of people uh, that that are, you know, they keep anywhere from two to five beehives. Uh, they've been doing it for a short period of time. They're interested in trying to do their part to bring babies back to the environment. So uh, certainly a, a, bee cl- a local bee club is, is one good source. I think going to the library and checking out a book and going through one of the basic books is critical for everybody. Don't you know? You got to read a book. There's so much resource information. You got to you got to go through at least a couple books. Get get your get your bearings and then make your mistakes. You're always going to make mistakes, and I continue to make mistakes after, even after 35 years. It's different mistakes because I learn each time. And there's always a new mistake to be made. But you know, having the the, the basics by reading a couple books uh, will make your your early mistakes much much less. Um, there's many local uh, quality bee suppliers uh, in the country. Uh, Illinois is home to one of the oldest in the nation. I think they they celebrated I don't know something like 150 years, and this is Dayton uh, in Hamilton, Illinois. And so uh, you can get uh, your bee equipment from a, from a quality supplier, and then you get yourself started. Uh, our, the uh, website for for our uh, the Lake County Beekeepers is uh, www.lakecountybeekeepers.org. And we have a little bit of information about our uh, our group. Fabulous. Well, I've got one uh, another question about the CCD. Are there any bees that appear to be immune to it, like the African bee? Or uh, well, you mentioned we use mostly European bees, and China sprayed too much, too many pesticides, so they have some issues. But are there any bees on the planet that appear to be immune to this? Uh, well, since there isn't a single thing to point to, it's really hard to answer that one one way or another. I would say if, in, in my first reaction is no, since there's no single identified uh, cause. Each, uh, each bee strain uh, has its traits and its abilities to deal with environment, to deal with pests and parasites, the African bee has been pointed to that says they deal with varroa mites better. So uh, they're able to. So one major problem uh, is that you know, or the one major problem they can deal with that. So they don't have problems with varroa. Uh, are they able to to deal with neonicotinoids or, or 
or or something else. I don't I don't know. So the you know there's constant there's a number of universities that are continuing to uh, breed for. Uh, cleanliness traits. They, they, there are certain traits that they try and deal with, and right now Varroa is the the biggest one that they're they're working on to try and create a European, gentle European honeybee, not an Africanized bee, but a gentle yeah. European honeybee that is uh, that is more uh, able to deal with Varroa. And I think that that if they're able to do that, that will help out significantly with the problems we've been facing here for the last twenty years. Yeah, I think I recall um, hearing some of the African bees are very aggressive, so that may not work out too well. You, you couldn't keep them here in, in uh, Illinois, and you don't want them. You know, they, you know, these are these are bees that are better off in the jungle in Brazil, uh, certainly yeah. not uh, in my backyard. Gotcha. Well, uh, in April of 2013 of this year, the European Union announced plans to restrict, restrict the use of certain pesticides to stop. Uh, bee populations from declining further. And by the end of the month, they passed legislation which banned the use of several, um, I hope I'll pronounce this right, neonicotinoids for the following two years. Do you think the United States will follow uh, with the rest of the world and ban these pesticides? I don't know yet. There's there's a lot of people lobbying for that, and I think that lobbying process uh, will take place. Uh, and uh, if... Uh, honestly, if the if the European Union uh, ban shows a significant improvement in die-offs, it would probably be a lot faster. But uh, there there's a lot of people discussing it. There's a lot of people that uh, are encouraging the government to do the same. Uh, I don't know uh, the success one way or another yet on that. Um, uh, again, I think it's to be seen. Okay. Now, we have about 20 minutes left of the show, and I have a, I guess this would be a controversial question. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to, I'm just going to ask you about um, a group of bees that was seized in Illinois that were allegedly resistant to Monsanto's Roundup, and if I could just read a little bit so people know what I'm talking about, um, okay. and then I want to get your response on this. Uh, the Illinois Agricultural Department illegally seized privately owned bees from renowned naturalist Terrence Ingram without providing him a search warrant and before the court hearing on the matter reports Prairie Advocate News. Beyond, uh, behind the obvious violations of his constitutional rights is Monsanto, according to this article. Ingram was researching Roundup's effects on bees, which he's raised for 58 years. And then he says, uh, quote, they ruined 15 years of my research, um, end quote, he told Prairie Advocate by stealing most of his stock. A certified letter from the Agriculture Department's apiary inspection supervisor, Stephen D. Chard, stated, quote, during a routine inspection of your honeybee colonies by inspectors Susan Kivico and Eleanor Balson on October 23, 2011, the bacterial disease American fowl brood was detected in a number of colonies located behind your house. Presence of the disease in some of your colonies was confirmed by a test result from the USDA Bee Research Laboratory in Beltsville, Maryland, that analyzed samples collected from your apiary. And, and then it just says Ingram can prove his bees did not have fowl brood and planned to do so at a hearing set in April, but the state seized his bees at the end of March and they have not returned them, and no one at the Agricultural Department seems to know where the bees are. And the bees could have been destroyed, or they could have been turned over to Monsanto, according to this article, to ascertain why some of his bees are resistant to Roundup. Without the bees' as evidence, Ingram simply cannot defend against the phony charges of fall brood. Worse, all of his queens died after Kiviko and Balson inspected his property outside of a presence and without a warrant. Of note, Illinois beekeepers are going underground after Ingram's experience and refuse to register their hives in case the state tries to steal their private property on phony claims. And this is from an article um, that I picked up off of the Internet. I don't know how factual all of this is and... I don't know this person, um, this beekeeper. So I, I just wondered if you had any comments you wanted to make on this article. Sure. I know where the bees are. They burn them. 
Oh. So, so, so this is. I, I've I've had some interaction uh, both uh, with uh, some. Of the, this is like a conspiracy theory article. Um, okay. uh, in my opinion, uh, Mr. Ingram is, is a, a poor beekeeper, and uh, he ha- he had hives that were infected, as determined by the state inspectors, which I believe the state inspectors in Illinois are very professional. Uh, I have I have in my early years of beekeeping uh, been given an order to burn my colonies because I had American Frau brood because I didn't know what I was looking at, uh, and I I took action on that uh, I took action on that um, situation. So uh, we have inspectors here that are in Illinois that are responsible for the overall health of bees and beekeeping in this state. Uh, we have a a legal requirement per the state of Illinois to register our beehives, and every one of my bee yards are registered uh, with the GPS locations, and so the inspectors can find them out and uh, and make them available. American fowl brood is very easy to find once you know what you're looking for. You have to know, uh, you have to have seen it one time to at least to really be sure but when I had American fowl brood, I had a beekeeper with 60 years of experience, or 50 years, I mean, an old-time beekeeper. He took five seconds to look in my hive, and he said, this one's rotten, burn it. I mean, it doesn't take a long period of time to judge that. These inspectors know what fowl brood looks like. So they should have taken the, the, the uh, they shouldn't have had to even go further with that. They should have issued their, their uh, warning and said, burn these colonies. But they took the second, the extra step, and sent them to a laboratory. A laboratory can determine conclusively uh, by looking at them under the microscope, uh, looking at the the, the the bees, and finding the 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 uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, foul brood is there, uh, and they can determine that in a laboratory scientifically. At that point, it's a guaranteed requirement for burning. The state is in, within their rights to require burning. And if the individual doesn't take action on it, they have the right to take those and burn those colonies immediately. Now, why does anybody care? Well, American fowl brood is, uh, is highly contagious from colony to colony. It can devastate your... I had, to burn, I had to burn six out of my seven colonies that were rotted with fowl brood. And wow. I had spread it from colony to colony. So it's highly contagious. And because I didn't know what I was doing, I spread it from colony to colony. So this guy, he's got foul brood in an area, and he's refusing to take action, which means all of his neighbors are at threat. So am I as a, as, am I as a citizen of the state of Illinois allowed to drink a bottle of, of whiskey and drive my car? No. It's against the law. And I shouldn't be allowed to do that. Well, he is practicing reckless behavior with his beekeeping. And all of this other stuff is uh, his, his attempt to try and keep his diseased colonies alive. So I'm, I'm in this particular one, when I read this, I know the inspectors. And uh, had I given, you know, coming to a courtroom months later and saying, I can prove it in court. Well, you can't prove it in court. You need laboratory results to be able to prove you don't have it. So I think this guy is a, is a beekeeper who had a, had a disease and was trying to use this other stuff as a smokescreen. So I, I'm, I'm with the, the state uh, and, and most responsible beekeepers in Illinois are with the state on this one. Uh, but this story has been managed to pick up to the, the conspiracy theorists and the people that don't like big government and all that kind of stuff. Personally, I'm happy that they took them, and I'm sure that they're burned in a pile, which is what I would have liked to have done. Uh, and I would have done, if, if, if it was me and I would have had them, they would have been burned right away because this is too an important a disease to a beekeeper to be able to go on. So all I the gotcha. Roundup and Monsanto stuff is all smokescreen and, and irrelevant information. Okay, I got you on that. All right. Now, what do you think the future is for beekeepers? Well, we're going to continue to, in the short term to face challenges uh, with bee die-off until we can get strains of bees that are more tolerant to the stresses that are being seen today. 
there's many things that are taking place. There's universities doing work. Uh, in Illinois, there's an Illinois Queen Initiative to try and breed local uh, bees uh, that have survived the environment here. You're trying to get bees that are more tolerant of the conditions here and continuing to breed off, can breed off of that stock and keep that strain going. And, and so the, the more bees that survive and you breed off of those, you're, you're trying to deal with bees that are, are more tolerant of the stress. And so the more things that, that, uh, the, that uh, using survival stock and raising next generation bees uh, will, will hopefully be the, the solution. So I think you're going to find even more hobbyists start to do more local breeding because uh, they recognize the fact that we need uh, more tolerant uh, strains. Gotcha. Now, we've already talked about some good sources of information about bees and beekeeping. Is there anything else that you'd like to add to the show tonight that uh, I have not asked? Well, the, the, uh, we mentioned the book. I don't know if we mentioned that YouTube has a lot of, I mean, there's so many videos on beekeeping now there. So check out beekeeping on YouTube. There's some great videos. And uh, if you want to do from online training, the Ohio State beekeepers have an excellent online course series. So somebody can go through and walk through some of those, and then the majority of them are free. And so you certainly can get a feel for what your your um uh, being faced with, or what uh, you know, if you're interested in doing this as a hobby. So, for other uh, other things to add, uh, we already talked about the yellow jackets, thing, and so uh, we don't have to talk about it. The, the honey bees are actually very gentle, and can be kept in uh, small areas, so they have them on rooftops, like they have in Chicago. Uh, in Lake County, we've had some ordinances for some of the unincorporated areas that that have been written that we're trying to get modified. They've kind of done cut and paste and, uh, and uh, uh, put honeybees in the same category as, as, as livestock and horses and, and cattle, and so requiring large spaces in unincorporated areas. And we think that we, we're working very closely with the Lake County government to, to try and get that modified. Yeah, so, I've heard that, too. Know, it, and, and I'm and I'm very hopeful that by, by the end of this year we'll get some modifications done. The the, the staff has been excellent uh, uh, to work with as we try and deal with some of the wording to to get it done so that it it works. Um, you know, if you're in if you're in Lake County or you're in some of the these other counties around Chicago or even in Chicago yourself, there's there's a lot of hobby beekeepers out there. And so you know, in, in Lake County alone, there's a hundred and uh, 150 other beekeepers uh, out you uh, that are just like you that uh, can be there for an ear to lit to to ask questions or a shoulder to lean on. Um, so just some some of the other things uh, you you know you talked in your original uh, in your original comments about honey. You know honey is one of the only foods that will never spoil. You put a you put a cap on it and that jar will last for a thousand years. They opened uh, King Tut's tomb and they found honey in there that had been put in at the time of the uh, the entombment and it was still good. Mm. If you take if you take that lid off, honey will absorb water from the air and ferment. That's why mead was your first alcohol beverage, is because the uh, honey was left open. The yeast that naturally occur in the environment, uh, like the sugars in in the in the environment, so me- so mead became uh, uh, the first alcohol beverage. And that led to the honeymoon. So the honeymoon is the month after the uh, after the marriage, and uh, mead was for celebration, and so uh, that's kind of how a honeymoon got into there. Uh, bees collect a number of things. Uh, propolis is uh, collected from the sap of tree and uh, resins, uh, resins from plants and trees. Uh, in Eastern Europe, they use that. Uh, they call that uh, like uh, uh, Russian penicillin. So it has antibiotic properties that people use for cuts and scratches and different scrapes. People that uh, have pollen allergies like to chew on honeycomb because it has pollen, uh, local pollen, especially if they can get it from a local beekeeper uh, that has pollen for the that uh, is of concern or that bothers their body. They can chew it. Uh, get some pollen in uh, that they might be allergic to, and then hopefully uh, build a tolerance uh, to that one. Um, there's some people that actually uh, 
take uh, bee venom for different things, and there's people played with that uh, or used that for arthritis issues or for uh, multiple sclerosis or a variety of different conditions uh, that it stimulates the body's audio, autoimmune system to deal with some of the, the threats. So there's some interesting things done uh, for, for bee products for um, uh, apotherapy for treating, for treating both humans and animals. And then uh, there's also bee bread that uh, I, I read something. I went to a, a conference and I saw heard about bee, bee bread that the Vikings oh. took on their trips. And so they mixed pollen and honey, and it fermented slightly, and it became very highly nutritious. Had some very interesting uh, vitamins that helped the, the Vikings as they traveled all over the world as they uh, as they were out on the ocean and didn't have access to to some of the you know the things that they might need to to keep themselves healthy. So there's lots of good things that the, the honeybee produces. Uh, it's a very gentle in, uh, it's a very gentle insect, and uh, a very fascinating hobby. You always end up having a story uh, to tell your friends, and so I would encourage anybody that's interested in doing it uh, to take a look, get that first book, look at that video, and see if you can uh, start your first beehive. Wow. Well, David, I want to uh, thank you for this very informative and interesting interview tonight. I'm going to close out the show, and to my listeners, until the next time we meet, take care. Mm -hmm.